Boom. What's up, people? Welcome to Creative Theory Podcast, the show that brings you conversations with visual artists about what their day-to-day is like, uh, how they got to where they got, what their struggles are, their goals, uh, what their journey looked like, and a lot more. Uh, coming at you live from Save and Radio in Vancouver, BC. And uh, I got a very special guest in the studio with me today. He's a art director, let's see, animator, artist, boxer. Are you a martial artist also? Yeah, I... This I, is I, Yusuf Mapara. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Yuli. Yeah, um, I feel like, actually, so Yusuf and I used to work together uh, at Roadhouse Interactive, and Yusuf was my art director, and uh, it was a pretty sweet experience, but I realized, even though we worked together for, what do you say, almost two years? Yeah, something like a year and a half. Yeah, I actually never ended up... I never ended up learning your story about how you even got into animation. Actually, I thought it was very curious, the fact that you got to art directing through animation. Right, yeah, because usually um, art directing is such a broad... It covers such a broad set of disciplines from, like, graphic design to effects, and usually people come more from concept art into art direction. Yeah, and I guess, like, especially... But you always drew, didn't you? Yeah, but not at, like, uh, not at the level, like you or a concept artist uh, yeah. a specialized concept artist i came more from animation so we we drew but it was um more just like uh i think studying of motion was my was my specialty and did you i'm just because yeah this is more of a unique path how did that end up happening did you know that you wanted to be an art director no um well if it's funny first i thought i wanted to be a professional fighter <laughs> and uh, I used to, nice. I used to uh, fight on Team Canada, and I went to um, one of my sponsors when I was fighting uh, was this company called H Two O Entertainment in in Calgary, and they were making Nintendo games. And I went to go pick up a check, and I saw them doing using some software. And I was a kid, and when I was a kid, I downloaded like uh, like a pirated copy of some 3D software <laughs> and I was playing around with it. So as I was sort of self-taught, but I didn't know you could do it for a living. And when I went to pick up the check for the, f- you know, for the sponsorship, I, s- I was like, oh, I know how to use that program. And they're like, you do? And so I came in and had um, like a little tour around and then I realized you could do that for a living. And so that then I s- kind of um, moved to Vancouver and, and uh, yeah, I went to school just to get a piece of paper. And then Wait, but up to that point, you're actually, the path was to become a, a professional or I mean you were a professional yeah. boxer well yeah I um I fought it was I was amateur like I didn't make professional yet and I was still um I was fighting Muay Thai actually and that was my goal yes yeah, was to become a professional fighter so and I you know had spent about um I don't know like 15 years or no about 10 years on that career path and then wow. switch gears but I loved I loved arts and I always did it as a hobby as a passion and I just didn't know you could do it for a job and I knew that um yeah I, I just knew i needed to do something and so i wanted to switch it i'd s- you know so that um martial arts and stuff could be my hobby and then I, if mm-hmm. i could do art for a living that'd be great and were you okay with that that w- like which one was more of a love i love both and like now i i, I always miss it's hard when as an artist because you have to choose what you want to do and that's like a uh, hard yeah and you sacrifice other things that you love and so i love too many things and but my love of many many different things ended up in a way um diluting each skill set but then as a artist i became like i had a broader foundation and then that later on as a as a director that broad foundation was my main tool Mm -hmm. that i and i but as a specialized artist it was always like you know because i love so many different things like playing music Mm -hmm. um, boxing all that stuff and they were all unrelated but when you start directing the broader knowledge you have kind of ends up being a valuable tool and it just makes you s- very well rounded yeah and, and it's actually th- it's really cool that the fact that you made it work for yourself and it, it was actually a benefit where for example for myself i constantly struggle with the fact that i actually do want to do everything as well uh, but then in the end it's uh, it's that choice how do you want to structure your life later on right where do you see this taking yourself and the fact that all these skills that for you came together into one which is being an art director that's really cool that it worked out in that way yeah, yeah but uh let me think so but uh, when you downloaded that software did i actually self-taught or did you end up going to school for animation right after yeah so 
when I was in school, I was taking this like AutoCAD program because yeah. I like uh, was into. I thought maybe I'll be an architect when I grow up or something. And then so, and then they had a software called uh, 3D Studio, and okay. it was like an old, like, uh, version that was like, and but our um, when I went to download the AutoCAD, I stumbled on this thing. So I like tried that, and then I was just like modeling like my transformers and making them <laughs> transform and stuff. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was super fun. It was like an animation program, and then. But it was hard to learn um, on my own. And then I learned it. Uh, and I had actually, like, I got to a level where I could could send it out to, like, a video game company and have a job interview. Wow. But, but then Wait, I... Wait, all by yourself? Yeah. Wow. E even as... Uh, um, but then I could never, like, land the job because I was quite young. Like, I was in high school <laughs> and I didn't have the maturity to understand it was a professional. But were they not hiring you because you were young? Did they know? I had an interview... Um, <laughs> At with what age? <laughs> I was like um, 17, I wow, think, and nice. I had an interview with Electronic Arts, yeah. and I came out to Vancouver, and there were seven people around a table, and they interviewed me, and then at the end, the guy was super nice, but he's like, we can't give you the job. I was like, why? He's like, well, because we we were actually applying, it was for a lead artist position, and I, I was <laughs> like, but I passed your art test, like, you brought me out for it, but I, they, I don't think they expected, like, some kid in high school uh. to be like, you know. So that's too bad that like your maturity is the only thing that stopped you from. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> have did a good job because maturity is a big part of it. And, it is a big part, and, yeah. and what happened was like, I remember they asked me questions like, why do you want to work at electronic arts? And <laughs> you're supposed to answer like, you're supposed to answer something like, oh, you guys are an industry leader, yeah. you know, and, and this, that. And I answered, oh, it'd be so cool. I could move out of my mom's house and buy a <laughs> motorbike. <And> that was, <laughs> so. Uh, you, you had ambitions. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. But I guess at that point, even already, your mind was already working in that mode, whatever that mode is. Because I don't think everyone can pick up a 3D package, especially on their own, and just get into it. Why do you think that is, or how? Do you actually do you think you had something in you that w just makes you a lot better? Um, yeah. So I used to. This is another weird thing that I don't know if people know about this scene too much. But when I was a kid, there was. There was it was before the internet. There was um, this thing called BBSs, okay. and um, BBSs were like uh, you dial up on your modem, and then you just you know people chat, and there's like different programs you can download and stuff. And so there was this whole um, secret kind of like side of BBSs where it was like the pirate BBSs, and they had like video games and stuff on there, and you needed like little code names to be on there. And I used to draw. ANSI's. ANSI's were these really low resolution like pictures. Okay. Were like emojis kind of thing? Is that no, what they out? were like full screen, like just using big blocks. And okay. and it was just like you it's like imagine you're just building a uh, elaborate comic book picture out of like Lego blocks almost okay. or something. So but it was something that was fast. It was the mo modems were so slow back then yeah, they yeah. couldn't display Im like images, they could display text. So you're basically drawing with text and people <laughs> these these BBSs would want these crazy pictures of like skulls or X Men or all this stuff. So we, that's what I that's how I got into computer art. And then, yeah, wow. and, and then it was in exchange for giving them a cool skull picture for their BBS. They would give me access to download their games and all that kind of oh, stuff. Wow. So, um, but that's what I was saying. So you already had some sort of inclination towards that. Yeah. Was it like was it almost like making art in Excel or something like an Excel sheet where you fill up a square? Kind of. Yeah. Chat? Yeah. But what was it? Um, so because it was text-based, did you actually have to learn some sort of coding or was it pretty simple? No, 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 it was just, yeah, you hit one button on your keyboard and it makes a block, you make another one, it makes <laughs> a half block, and you just kind of... Nice. Yeah. And the fact that you spent so much time in that. Yeah, it was like really dorky stuff, but it, it um, I don't know, I, I from that, on one of those things, I went to, yeah, that's, I stumbled on one of those 3D programs, and yeah. then I just, it, I had a lot of fun just making a cube fly around, and then I'm like, I wonder if I can make a transformer, and mm. then it, and then I started to ask my friends, do you still have your transformers from when you were a kid? And then, yeah, pretty soon I s was into that, but it was just like for fun. Just kept going from there. Yeah. And then, this is usually, to me, an interesting topic, is that everyone starts out drawing, usually, you know, pencil, paper, and then maybe some paints. But then you end up in animation, and I'm, or you know, some people go into 3D modeling. But I'm always curious how that transition happens, where, you know, you'd think that the path would just continue. You'd be drawing and drawing more. Actually, well, I mean, 2D animation is still a lot of drawing. But how did you make that choice? Because it sounds like you're actually doing a lot more 3D modeling as you're picking up that software to then transition to. 
Yeah, as a kid, I used to draw a lot. I used to see my my parents had those Robert Bateman paintings of like oh, yeah. wolves and stuff, <laughs> and I used to just draw them. Super it's, realistic. Yeah, yeah, and then um, so that kind of got me into art, and that's when. But then I didn't really like, you know, with computer art, I just saw it as a weird bridge between video games and art, you know? So, mm -hmm. like, it didn't really seem like, te it didn't think of it as technical. I just thought of it as kind of like a game you can play to make art, you yeah. know? And then um, I continued drawing, and, and that was always a big part. But then once I got into 3D modeling, um, I really liked the sculpting and the mm -hmm. painting textures. And then I... Um, I went to school just to get a piece of, you know, paper, and then... <laughs> That's all it is? Yeah, because I, at the end, I, I realized I was getting interviews, but I just couldn't land a job, and then I was like, I'm just going to go to school and get, like, a, you know, certificate or whatever, and then I'll probably... And then that worked, and then I was able to get but a job. But you did it just to make it look good rather than to learn? Yeah, to make it legit. Like did you actually not learn much in school? Um, I learned... Uh, so this is the interesting thing. So I was already a very proficient modeler, mm -hmm. so when I went to school, um, I had wasn't really trained in any animation and then the teachers there really started like uh exposing me to animation and the principles of animation mm -hmm. and then i really got into that and then when i applied for my first job um i applied as a character modeler and they said you can have the character modeling job but we liked your animation too oh, wow. what would you want to do and this is i guess going to probably be the theme is do you specialize all your skill points in mm -hmm. one thing or do you spread them out so then i was i realized i'm like i'm a good character modeler i could probably do this job well but they're offering me a shot at animation, which I'm weaker at. But if I take that job, then I'm going to get to be better as an animator. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll spread my skill points. So I, I took the animation job and then I got I started learning animation. And then my character modeling skills got rusty and the tools, you know, <laughs> changed over the years. But then I was an animator who could model. Mm -hmm. And then um, and I think it's funny that in the end, when I started art directing, um, those like having a broader skill set help me lead a team of both animators and and modelers Which, uh, it just means that you understand them better yeah and you can talk to them in their language yeah exactly yeah. that's really cool but when I, I guess when you picked that job the idea of being an art director wasn't in your mind just then it was just i want to be good at animation as well yeah yeah, yeah i wanted to um yeah i just wanted a chance to like sit with senior animators and learn from them that's and, awesome. and and you know just do that for a year or two years and so see how much i could soak up it's amazing that your brain and your mentality was already in that mode of trying to get better and to learn. I think I'm trying. I'm trying to think when I actually started thinking of okay, I want to surround myself with people who are better, so I can get better. Because it, it gets intimidating and it's scary and it's not pleasant. You know what I mean? But the fact that you were already doing that, how, how, how did you know? It's well, how did you know the tricks? It's very similar to what you did because you started as an animator. Yes. And then yes. all of a sudden you were at a company I believe that was like hey do you want to do some concept art and that wasn't your forte that was like your you know but you were like yeah if I okay put me in and then you started doing that and then all of a sudden you became an amazing concept artist being Thanks. by doing it for eight hours a day right at that point I wanted to wanted it to be my forte which is why I think I jumped on the opportunity right away because I wanted it I just enjoyed painting I think a lot more than animation which is why I'm just trying to remember when I started actually consciously trying to put myself in a situation where I was, you know, the least or at least skilled because I really crave it now where, because, you know, I guess hopefully, or I have a better understanding of what it takes to be, become a better artist and just to grow as a person, you know, usually surround yourself with better people. I just don't, I don't remember when that idea clicked, but it seems like, yeah, it happened a lot earlier for you. It happened in, even in martial arts, like I remember... Uh, I wonder if that's what it is, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was really good at, there was a period where I was really good with my legs, because I had really long legs, and I was good at kicking, and I was, I didn't feel super confident with my boxing, mm -hmm. and there was one fight I was training for, where in my training camp, I actually broke my big toe, <sighs> and so I was like, ah, oh, crap, and I, I didn't want to cancel the fight, so I'm like, I better... But I needed to use my training camp well, so I'm like, I think I should use this as a chance to just learn how to box properly. So then, mm. um, and so. But you're doing my tie though. Yeah, so I was doing my tie. So it's both. But I like uh, my the way I fight is always keeping people really far away mm -hmm. at the end of With the long, long legs. legs. Yeah, and then, um, so it was a thing of do you double down on your strength or do you put your time into developing your your weaker areas? And then that, I think, you know, in sports sometimes you 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 decide, oh, I'm going to train up my weaker areas instead of 
you know yeah your tic- real- your tactician from <laughs> young age <right? laughs> yeah so playing tactics yeah you broke your toe did you end up fighting yeah uh it was really dumb that i did that though because <laughs> <laughs> what well it was it was a blessing in disguise because what happened was i um when i broke my toe like I, it was a really uh i had a fight scheduled with a fighter that i was really in uh like respected since I was like younger wow. and um, I was really nervous about fighting because he had a lot more experience and when I broke my toe the first thing that went in my head was oh thank god now I don't have to fight that guy <laughs> and then um, and then the f- second thing that went in my head was I was so mad at myself for thinking that that I'm like now you have to fight him with a broken <laughs> toe <laughs> because you can't like what's out of this I wonder if that was a good or yeah w- did that mean that he should not have fought that fight yeah, how much I older was he? he was um I mean, at this point, I was 20, and I think he was probably like 28 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was, but he, um, I, at this point, I was like fighting independently. And so w- if you have a coach, that's where the fighter's job is to just be brave and do it. But your coach's job is to kind of stop you and be like, hey, this is not mm-hmm. going to be a proper training camp. Just we'll postpone it for six months or something. And so, but I, I um, so I just kind of went in yeah. the wrong way. Pretty stubborn. Yeah, I went in stubborn. <laughs> but the good thing was I learned how to I learned how to box well. And then yeah, now yeah. to this day, like I grew as an individual, and yeah, I wouldn't yeah. ever have learned that because I would have hid behind my strengths instead of. Uh, that's so cool. Exploring my weaker areas. Yeah, it's like, it's really fascinating because that mentality was in you, it seems like from a pretty young age. Mm-hmm. I thought like and the fact that it's like playing throughout your life. You know, you're talking about just like not being, trying not to be weak, from any angle. Yeah. I, I like that that analogy works in art as well you know whether it's I mean I guess fighting is an art form as well so and when I started art directing I was the lead animator at at that point yeah um, I was actually I don't know if the numbers are correct and I wonder because I went went to your website before we're talking and said you're in the industry for 16 years oh man I think now I've been working for 19 years yeah Yeah. well that's even crazier because you wrote that it only I think it took you four years to become an art director to get to our, our directing job. Yeah, huh? yeah. That it's amazing. That's so quick. Yeah, it was just um, the first two and a half years. I didn't even like progress. Like I was just an animator. I didn't even make senior animator. And then I switched into video games. And then I had um, I just quickly, I I I quickly used my experience to become a lead animator. Mm. And then I from there it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I got an opportunity to make the jump to, to become an art director. And then, at, but I was very young and actually the reason, the reason my, my producer hired me for it, because back then I was at a company where there was five art directors in what? this role, <laughs> a, like in this role previously, and they all within one game lost their job because it was, and then, so they told me, they're like, we like you, but this, something's dysfunctional about this role where every time the team has a little mutiny and then they <laughs> overthrow their art director. But is it because, so did they fail because of the co- clients or the team itself was getting they, rid of their art directors? They failed because the, t- the expectations on the art director were so broad. Like you have to lead an animation team, you have to lead an effects team, you have to lead the graphic designer, yeah, you have yeah. to lead the concept artist. And that usually they just came from one area. So like mm. a, our previous art director was a graphic designer, a really good graphic designer. So then that's kind of odd, did, actually. And then when he he had confidence directing the front end and the, the mm. UI, but then when it came to like character design or um, animation, he sort of was like scared to make a call, and then it didn't really like work out well for the team. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a great guy, but it just and then I've s- you see it all the time. Somebody's in one discipline, and then um, so usually the ones that can kind of succeed in that are come from concept art, b- yeah. you know, but. Um, but in that case, you know, me, my broad approach mm-hmm. actually helped me because I could I could kind of communicate with each of the teams, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's almost like a different style of art directing, right? It's like a different school of thought. Well, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I couldn't be better th- than them at all of their jobs. Like, you know, I couldn't, mm-hmm. as a lead animator, you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to be the strongest animator on the team. But when you're the art director, you can't be a better you know um ideally right you can't be better than one of your team because the whole idea is that they're specialized right That's exactly what you're yeah. yeah so but you have to know how to like leverage their talents yeah. and you have to know how to keep you know bring out the best in everybody yeah. so and, and as you're talking i think we should let people know because you worked in crash games right is that what you're talking about yeah i first worked on um uh 
I first worked on TV, like Transformers cartoons and Barbie cartoons and stuff, and then I switched nice. to video games. Uh, and I worked on a um, Simpsons hit yeah, and run. I saw that. Do you know you have an IMDb page? No. Yeah, you do. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that's what I saw. I saw Simpsons and then the Crash Bandicoot games, right? Yeah, and, and so then what happened was um, then I was an animator. Then I worked on some Crash Bandicoot games, and I became the art director. So that's when you became the art director. Yeah, and then um, and I did that. So I then I everyone's happy. That's cool. And then <laughs> I s But then I made another leap where after that, I did creative direction on my own game um, f for PS4, and that was even a broader step because I had to be in charge of game design and mechanics and tuning and yeah. and the art direction so man that's uh i failed at my uh intro because that's one thing i forgot to mention you're the creator one of the creators creator of secret ponchos um yeah we um or creative director is what yeah you're i was the creative yeah. director and it started as a passion project that's probably my project that i'm the most proud of in my career is a uh, bunch of friends and i were just like let's just make our own game like outside of a corporate environment and that, then yeah that, that's so incredible that's actually yeah I, mean, I wish i mentioned that in the beginning but to me that's in incredibly fascinating the fact well because there must be a lot of misconceptions about what it actually takes to even make a game you know the amount of people and hours it takes and then the fact that you actually just jumped into that is really cool <laughs> yeah it started it's crazy how it started it started as i just wanted to learn how to make my own game even if it was like super small and just like like just and I would learn how to program it myself and like you know and just um, and I didn't know anything about programming but I was like I'm gonna learn how to program and just make my own little like Pac-Man game or something and then what happened was <laughs> I was but then my friends who are like you know art directors or really talented artists at different companies are like oh you're gonna make your own game can I help you and then pretty soon I had a group of my friends that was like a stronger team than any team I've worked with before it like visually like like artists that were you know at big companies like uh like blizzard and stuff nice. like that offering to help and then i was like wow we can make a really good game if we all if we can find yeah, some programmers yeah, and if we build can build the dream team yeah build the dream team so then we um we just started animating stuff as if it was a game mm -hmm. and then and pretty soon just kind of like we found some funding and we were able to hire some real programmers and then it became a, a, a real project and yeah you're rushing through this you're making it sound too simple <laughs> but did did your friends that were jumping on uh, the project with you did they already trust you meaning like did you see did they see you as a person like to lead this project because they knew your qualities or were they getting on because it sounded like a cool idea I think they were creatively inspired by it. So I was just like, hey. So you already had something like, hey, this is, here's my idea. I yeah, I'm like, okay. hey, I'm making a spaghetti western fighting game. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm making it. <laughs> and then everyone's like, well, if you need, um, do you need audio? Because I can write spaghetti western music. I'm like, yeah, we do. And then someone, nice. another person's like, well, I can give you some like cool character designs. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. some another friend was a modeler. She's like, I'll model them for you. And then you, and I would animate them. So then we were able to like, build a really really cool like previs of what the game could be like if we could make it and then we were with that we were able to get some we got a letter from sony saying if you can make this game we'll let you put it on the playstation oh my god at what point at what point did that happen throughout the process that was really early on like before we even and then once we had that letter that we can get it on playstation this was like 2010 how did they even know about the game how how did they find out no we send it oh you sent we, it to we them. send the okay. video yeah oh, and then oh, okay, okay, and okay, then okay. And then they're like, if you can make this, we'll put it on PlayStation. Wow. And once we had that letter, then we were able to go to um, investors and go, hey, we actually have a distribution channel f that wants this product. We just need money to make it now. And then so we got someone then to to give us money to. <laughs> and then did you have to learn the business side of it? Was it yeah. for you? Yeah. yeah then, you had to do it? Yeah. Then wow. the, cr the crappy thing was they, <laughs> the crappy, re yeah. the cr they required a whole bunch of like like a business plan and financial breakdowns all these things so then i had to pause the creative for like three months and just figure out all that stuff you learn in your mba or something like how to write a business plan and how to make a financial proposals and all this God. stuff and then um but then i was able i needed to do it because if i didn't do that we wouldn't have been able to like communicate with them to get the money right and then once we did that we gave them what we they needed and then i ended up learning that stuff and then we um yeah we got the funding and then i got to put that stuff on the Man, side you're, you're like the king of having all the skills of being the most well-rounded person well well-rounded but i always feel like insecure around specialists because they're so good at what they do i always feel so envious well you know? and they're probably insecure around you because you know so many things i think it's just maybe being an artist or something as you know can't be good at everything uh 
Yeah, it's, I find it really interesting with artists that we all feel, I don't know how you feel, but I almost saw my friends I talked to about this, we all admitted to each other that we all feel like frauds, you know, <laughs> or like, and if people like our stuff, it's like, oh, it's because they don't really know enough, oh, you know? so funny. Do you feel like that? I do, I do. I, and then... I try not to, but I, I know what you're talking about. I don't know if you had those days, but especially some days when you're at work, and it's not working out for some reason. Just like one of those crappy days, you're like, they're going to find out. <laughs> 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 I know they're paying me, but they're going to find out. Can't do it. <laughs> and then the last straw was one of my friends who's like one of the best concept artists in the industry. Are you going to name names? Yeah, okay. I'll say, yeah. Well, yeah, Daryl Mandrick. He, yeah. he told me. What's up, Daryl? He, he said that he felt like that. And I was like, what, ah. dude? If you feel like that, there's no... You're like so good at what you do. If you feel like a fraud that you'll be... You know, then to me that's insane because uh, for uh, if, if you want to look it up, Daryl, two R's, right? D A R R Y L. One R, yeah. One R, Magic. He's a I would say Vancouver legend. Concept. Uh, uh, he, he is crazy good, but yeah, I, I actually didn't know. But I guess it just shows you that no matter how good you are, you can never reach far enough. Well, yeah. Then I f then I realized I'm like, okay, dude, you're. If I even had a teach half your skills in drawing, I would be like, I'm done. That's good. Then you, you know? just accept the fact that we're all broken. You're like, we're, yeah, yeah, so there's something dysfunctional that you take <laughs> on from being an artist where you're just always, um, you're never, you're, you're always afraid you're not good enough. And knowing that he felt like that, did that allow you to feel okay about yourself? You know what I mean? It's like if people who are the best feel like that, then I should might just like might as well accept my fate. You know what I mean? It once, was always going to be like this. So once I saw that he had it, I snapped out of it. I'm like, oh, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be hard on myself. I'm just going to celebrate whatever skills I have. So if I can like draw a stick man, then I'm, a, I'm an artist that can draw a stick man. If I can, you know, and just, and just not, because if no one can feel like they're really an artist, then that's a messed up world, right? That's a really, that's a really good mentality, and I think it's really good advice, which is really hard to follow, I imagine. You know, you can tell someone to feel good about yourself, and your art is amazing, but there's that, and then there's that voice inside of yourself, I guess. Yeah, because then you realize there's no end to all this insecurity, so why carry it around? Just just be happy with, just, I mean, always strive to be better, but, but just um, give yourself credit for what you do. Yeah. Yeah, and... And of course, then there's that other argument which people always bring up that, hey, if you're not happy with yourself, that means you're just going to try to get better. And that's what probably carries you forward. But usually I just, I hope that it doesn't have to be so extreme yeah. to the point where, you know, like try to be happy somehow. There's another guy, uh, I don't know if I've shown you his work, uh, Kyle J. Scott. People follow him on Instagram, please. He's super awesome. But I feel like he is so incredible at illustration. I think one of my favorite illustrators out there and he i think he's like that as well it's like no it's not not that good like, come on kyle <laughs> <laughs> it's too awesome yeah so uh i want to ask because you kind of i guess we got off of the topic a little bit you're saying when you left your work to start this uh, your own game was it because you got tired of the corporate environment or why would you do that because i think that yeah, yeah i think i just needed a break from uh feeling like i just wanted to creatively express something instead of like making a product you know for like for I, w I wanted to make a game that I felt was like a creative expression and then and not just a, a product to, to fill like a gap on a shelf you know and, and so mm. I, so that's and that's before the indie scene in gaming really like there wasn't really indie games before at that time it wasn't like a term because to get your game on an Xbox or a PlayStation you needed to kind of or Nintendo you needed to be a company and, mm -hmm. and um, but at around that time a few indie companies started like people just started finding a way a path to to get their stuff and I just thought well if you know someone that can program and someone that can model and someone that can animate and someone that can do send and you can you can make a game then the question was how do you just get it on one of those things and then yeah. we were um, our game was the f there was eight indie companies when Sony did their PlayStation 4 press conference, mm -hmm. and we were one of the eight um, that were on stage. And that was the first time an indie company was ever on stage during a press conference for one of the har major hardware releases. What? Did you guys, so you guys there, the first, actually, yeah, that's, that's yeah. that first, wow. So we were, they called us the Indie 8, you know, the eight studios. Yeah, it was yeah. like, that's amazing. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I had cool. no idea. That's so cool. You're like, putting a what is it what is the saying you're like plying down the path for everyone else to follow almost well it, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll 
I mean, all the early indie companies, they really, they broke through a barrier where, and then it made it easier for other indie co- indie developers to see like, hey, now there's actually, actually works right yeah. Now. And it was tough. Like even when, s- when we went on PlayStation, Sony actually back then wasn't even allowed to send dev kits for you to work on in your home. Wait, like was that secretive? Well, yeah, and they had um, they had to they wanted to support us, but they had to like go talk up the chain and get them to reverse some policies so that like an artist can have a d- <laughs> PS4 dev kit at their home and stuff. And, and it's s- like look at it, look at the world now, though. Right? Yeah, now yeah, it's it's yeah. So, but then now it's a very I think it's cool that there's so much support for indie development and mm-hmm. that like it's it, it's like a common term and there's the pathways are more uh, macheted clear you know <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you yeah but you had to go through all the hard work yeah, yeah. it was it was ex- ex- exciting though um did you sorry just, i keep stressing that point because i think it's a common thread where i always find a lot of artists who work in the industry i guess quotation marks or not you know just working for someone no matter what it is there's often the sentiment of people not feeling creatively um challenged or they're not getting their uh, full creativity out in whatever way just because you know in reality yes you're making a product for someone else and i think it's very common so um you're saying um yeah i guess when you left to make your game how many years did it take for you like how long were you in the industry before you actually left and were you actually frustrated or because you know there's, there's a difference between hey i just want to make something uh my own rather than i'm so tired of this what can i do that can make me feel good I wasn't I wasn't frustrated but I just my mind opened up to an idea of a new creative approach and I was I realized that um, and I wanted to explore that like I was fascinated by this idea that what if you just had one main emotion you wanted to create in a in a person and like it was your sort of your thesis and and it could be something like I want to make my audience feel the joy of discovery or i want to make my audience feel the the adrenaline of competition or i want to i want my uh audience to feel their own sense of ego and pride Mm -hmm. and and then so then and then you build a game around how do i make an audience feel that and so that was what i wanted to explore this idea that you take an emotion and then that's the core and then your game, your product is sort of the experience that's going to lead them there. But you're designing it always with that goal in mind. And so, um, and I wanted to approach it like that. And so that was w- what inspired it. This is this is why I love working with you. That was uh, so well spoken, and the the way you approach it, I I find it's you show how much of a craft it can be and it should be. Uh, you know, because what you just said right now, it could do, apply to whether you're like writing a novel or. A movie where I think often video games get like a bad reputation of like oh you just run around and kill things you know where and maybe there's games like that of course but your approach to it is so artistic and it and the the amount that you care and the storytelling in it yeah I really worked uh, enjoyed working with you like for that reason that um, kind of the attention and you show how important it is with every decision that you make I thought it was very oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that idea of the the thesis, the end result you want to make, the experience you want to create, was um, it helped guide every little decision. Though it helps mm-hmm. you decide, like, oh, what mechanics are in and which ones are out, or which what should the music feel like, or what should the you know the art style look like. It kind of all of a sudden you have um, something that kind of helps answer those questions, guide those. How did you learn that? Cause that's a big one. I think it's very easy to be like, "Hey, I want this thing to be this, 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 and it should be a shooter with for kids, and then it should have dinosaurs and monsters and robots." You know, like yeah. people scatter. Where what you're saying is like it's a clarity and vision and being able to really focus on this, you know, like say like figure out what your idea is and go with it rather than throw a bunch of stuff into it. Yeah. So it was a kind of a, it was about a. It's a process that took me about a year to understand, and it was on one of my last games I was working on at this big company, and I started playing a lot of different games, and when I was playing um, Grand Theft Auto 4, I remember there was this moment where I crashed into a, 
um, hot dog stand, <laughs> and a bottle of mustard flew off. <laughs> and I was I it I, I was surprised by the level of detail in okay. that game. So I had an emotional response to the mustard flying, and I was like, <laughs> oh wow, like. Wow. And then I realized that that um, that that's the experience when you play a game like that that game specifically they try and deliver attention to detail and bring so many millions of small things to life and they try and surprise the audience so in a way what i realized was that the bottle of mustard wasn't important if the next game goes and puts a bottle of mustard that flies off no one's going to care that's not that's not what it is right yeah you're not and so like trying to repeat you can't rep replicate the success of that by copying it the actual thing you need to to replicate would be we need to surprise our audience with with our uh, attention to detail mm-hmm. so then that just becomes the expectation so then when they make the next grand theft auto they're going to need to to deliver that same experience they're going to have to find a new like level and so whereas i noticed then i looked at our game designers and i, I saw that they were copying things from other games without understanding like what was it like why was it in there and what and then I started looking at like um, other games. I'm like, oh, cool. Like, well, I got this is the emotional experience I get out of playing this game. Why do I play other games? Like, what emotional experience do I get out of playing um, Tetris? Mm-hmm. You know, and what? And then I started thinking like, why? Yeah, why do people play Tetris? Like, what do they need in their life that they're sitting there and doing this? And then I started thinking a little bit about like. You know the different dopamines and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that that get fired. <laughs> Going down the ke- uh, chemistry. Here yeah, and then it le- it led to that, and then I talked to my producer, who's this really cool lady, um, Kirsten Forbes, and mm-hmm. then she was just like, "You should read this book, um, The Selfish Gene," and it was just a. You read that? Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Who who was it? Um, do you remember who wrote the book? I just. Uh, I think it's Richard Dawkins. Dawkins, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I I actually listened to I think an audio book of that. Yeah. That's really cool that you actually went down yeah. so far. I mean, it and then and then because it wasn't like stuff back then written on video game development, but it was just like that was just like why do we do anything? Like why do we need to? L- it, it basically started asking myself why, why, why until I got to this point. Like why are we even playing games? Like what yeah, do we yeah, yeah. like? And and then um, yeah, and then and then it sort of started kind of clicking that okay, there might be reasons. There might be reasons um, in our biology where we feel that if we say need to compete with each other, mm-hmm. where if we're practicing competition, we get released little like dopamines mm-hmm. that make you feel good. So then it's like, okay, well then I know, then I kind of reverse my um, process to be like, okay, well I should just start there. Like I should just start at like, what is the, you know, emotional experience I want to create? Were you doing it for the right reasons? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll explain because there's games these days where they actually play on that neurochemistry but then they abuse it yeah you i know what i mean Could yeah so now i now i don't like it anymore because now people like the game psychologists and stuff have gotten advanced enough to start thinking about like reward systems and yeah, addictions yeah. and using that to their advantage to that's really scary but scary. that's just everything like any app and i mean any product yeah. out there right i used it more for creative reasons of like you know how do you scare so, like I want to make you could be like I want to make a game that scares somebody and that they play it because they like the thrill of being scared or mm-hmm. I want to make a game that um, someone feels uh, emotional like you know like those games where you have like a little pet mm-hmm. you know it's like yeah. well <laughs> why do people play that and it's like maybe they yeah. they want to feel the endorphins that come with taking care of something and nurturing something you know and yeah. so like um, yeah, and video games just seems to be, like every game seems to deliver like a different kind of experience. Mm-hmm. But all these are just animal and human experiences that we need. And and so it's not like games is just do it delivering the same thing. Some games are giving you like nurturing experiences, and mm-hmm. some games are giving you problem solving. And some games just the f- I really was fascinated by like games that they make you curious about mm-hmm. something enough and then you learn something and then you learn it pays off with a, like learning you know like is that why you went to games i was actually wondering because your um, your path and your mind seems to be so clear specifically towards that experience because you did work in creating tv animation but then pretty quickly you're just games and then it just went off from there is that why why like why games apart um from- yeah so i i 
when I got into games, I was, little, I was younger, but I knew when I was working in TV, I kind of felt like the storyboard was there and I was supposed to animate a shot. And I, I remember feeling like if I died and someone else <laughs> animated the shot, the show would still be the same. Uh, I know the feeling. Okay, yeah. And then I was like, I, so I'm not really making... I'm making a small creative impact. Like maybe the performance would be slightly different, but the overall would... You know, and then I was like, I want to work somewhere where I can like have uh, a broader impact where like the product is way different. And then when I worked on the Simpsons game, you know, they were, the designers had their game laid out and all stuff. And I remember I made a suggestion. I'm like, oh, well can you know what if we add like a kick button on the character so that you can like kick the pedestrians <laughs> and stuff and, th and then no, idea. yeah and then so then they put it in and then all of a sudden like the game changed you know and then the people liked that mechanic and then they rolled with it and they expanded it more and, and then um but i felt like wow i it was the first time in my career i felt like if i wasn't here this would be a different like game it made a huge impact yeah and then and I, yep. I got addicted to that you know that's so cool it's such a minor thing and that actually changed it and so, I guess what you're doing in games is something that just cannot be done in other medium because of the interactivity of it. You know, you're like you're talking about people getting curious, but then being able to have the interactive aspect within it. I think that when you do like movies and music and all that stuff, I think it's the same thing. Like I think you have to um, empathize with your audience about like you have to try and put yourself in their shoes of like where like what frequency are they sort of operating at and then you kind of play with that free like you're like okay i want to build some tension you know and mm -hmm. then i want to like release that tension yeah. you know and i think that i i think that stuff's really interesting and it kind of i feel like it exists in all art forms even like a painting mm -hmm. will do it and 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 a song will do it and a movie will do it and so in a way all the prints are these artistic principles they're common between all these things and that's the thing that I realized by dabbling with different, yeah, yeah, yeah. like being a generalist and, and doing, I noticed that, wow, like the experts in one thing are giving you these principles. It's the same principles that they're giving you in another thing. And, another, mm -hmm. and even in like boxing, it's the same principles, you know? That's and cool. yeah. And I, I, when I realized that, then I realized like, okay, you don't have to specialize in something. All of these things kind of cross pollinate each other. And so, so then do you see yourself going out of video games and trying something else or do you are you on that path um well i think that when we did secret ponchos i got to explore more like things like the music side because mm -hmm. it's a spaghetti western game and spaghetti western music super cool and yeah. so um <laughs> you know and then and then even we when we were making trailers and stuff we started exploring that so i think it doesn't have to necessarily be outside of games but it's just even outside of what like just where your focus is you know mm -hmm. so even down to when we were making a, like a single song then we tried to uh, apply that that same principle yeah i really find it interesting though the thing about the cross pollination between stuff because i remember i hit um a sort of cap in my boxing mm -hmm. and i felt like i was just doing things the same way all the time and then when i something from music got me out of that that cap and it was um wow that's interesting yeah, yeah it was weird Did because you change your mind your thinking yeah it changed my thinking because what happened was i saw um i was just watching the same footage i was watch of muhammad ali hitting a bag but then i noticed the way he like the way we were trained to hit combos is we like learned the let like it's like a b c b like might be like jab cross hook cross right mm -hmm. and so we thought of it like that but when when ali was hitting the bags he wasn't really worrying about the combo. He's worrying about the timing. So, in so there might be A B C B, but that's different than like that might have a rhythm like ba 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 ba. But you could go ba 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 or ba 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 ba. You know, or and and Which so is music and like I guess the yeah. kind of one rhythm. Yeah. And then I realized it's like oh the punches don't matter. It's the rhythm that matters. And then and then he just had a natural sense that he would just say the rhythms. And then that's why he was so good at 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 his timing. And then I was like um, it just opened up that. And when I I th was learning, when I was playing music, um, my roommate was a jazz musician. And he's like, why are you always hitting everything on the, <laughs> on, every time there's a beat, you're, you're, four, you're playing it on the beat. Yeah, yeah, on he's beat. like, syncopate it sometimes. Notes, like, yeah. and, then, and then it'll surprise the audience and it feels good to kind of offset it. And then, but then I realized I'm like, holy crap, it's good to syncopate your opponent, you know? <laughs> and, and even if it means you hold the punch back for like a, a, 
a quarter of a You're second. Doing jazz style punch. Yeah, punches. And, and and then all of a sudden it just clicked like that. And then I look at all the great people fighting, and that's exactly what they're doing. But I just you know, and then so. That's I've never heard that before. That's such an amazing way to look at it, because it totally makes sense. Like yeah. the timing, because it is timing. But if you yeah like if you're saying you're tying it in with music because to me it seems like most people do have that um it's like the timing in you it seems very human to be like one two three four it's almost like you have to break yourself uh, i used to play drums or so i remember like learning syncopation was b tricky because it feels unnatural and i wonder if that's actually what boxers do it's like they they break the rhythm but yeah. i mean it's not but it's not like you think of it in four four you know what i mean like it's not like you're thinking it's like one two but uh, I wonder what kind of relationship there's there. Can good boxers play drums really well and play <laughs> <laughs> I, weird timings? I think there's different people with different fighting styles. And I think there's definitely like the Mayweathers of the world and mm -hmm. stuff. They have just good rhythm and, you know, and they, or guys like Ali and stuff, they have a strong sense of rhythm in everything okay. they do. So, but then, you know, there's obviously you guys that are just going to like power their way through just snares like and not think about timing. One punch, yeah. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, there's definitely like an example of the rhythm was when you punch someone and then they block it, right? And so, but there's that moment right after they block where they're starting to kind of like relax a bit, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, it's better to just kind of like catch them there, you know, and even just hold the punch a little longer, you know? Um, yeah, so it's not as important to get out as fast as you can. It's just like catching them sort of quarter, between steps or something, you know? I love the way you're looking at it. I'm smiling right now. <laughs> you're, you're, I'm being enlightened. And so then the question is, in a painting, then does that, what would you do to, if a, you know? Yeah, is there where's a way the to, rhythm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. is there a, a painting where everything is just on the beat and it's like, how can I make this more dynamic and exciting, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that's like the rhythm and composition and the shape language, right? Like where, actually, yeah, what you're bringing up, you, you often see in, people who are I guess beginners they would usually uh, make everything the same size so like, like speaking of contrast uh, but visually like in a where time is taking out but visually it can still have it like can have that rhythm I guess yeah yeah it's so crazy yeah. that the same everything ties in the same yeah. principles are in all these art forms you know but I try to think like that especially uh, when I do you know, fine art or digital art. And I know those are a lot closer together rather than other things. And I do believe that everything ideally should benefit one another. But I wonder if it, it is only so if you're conscious of it. You know what I mean? You seem to be very thoughtful about everything you do. So when you do go, like, transition from one thing, like I'm sure, like, if you cook or something, like, helps you with art in some <laughs> way, too, because of how you think of it. It seems like but the missing factor or what's really important here between those aspects or between those different things that you do is actually being aware of how they can benefit one another. And I mean, hopefully they do. And that's why I really, I'm, like I said, I'm fascinated by the fact that you did martial arts and boxing and then that's tying into art. I think that approach and that perspective is so unique. I guess, I guess in general, I'm mean, like usually fascinated yeah. with people who are I guess, just uh, doing different things and they have a different interest because that allows you to be more unique. And actually, it totally makes sense to me why you went in anim into animation if you did boxing and then music because animation is timing right right that's such an important thing yeah it, it was it's um i definitely love too many things i wish <laughs> i wish i could uh, i wish i could have three or four lifetimes it's like you and every other artist yeah at work i always complain that i wish i had more time there's there's really not enough how's uh how's your time uh balance now especially because now you're a father and you're still being really ambitious with the projects that you want to create. Um, have like, have you learned a lot of tips or have things changed? Yeah. Like now that's, as you know, the most important commodity, I guess. Yeah. yeah so I'm, I am a, I'm single 50% of the time. I'm a single parent <laughs> for a five year old. So that takes a lot of your time. And mm -hmm. so, um, and then, you know, I have a full-time job as an art director and then I also have, personal projects that are really really important to mm -hmm. me to not just be dreaming about doing one day but to be making progress on and so um i guess i prioritize i'm like okay if i have a day i have to make sure i get my eight like eight hours solid 
of my day job in. Mm -hmm. But I need to make sure my kid is alive and like fed <laughs> and like I teach her a little bit of reading Criteria. and she I'm a good parent and that she feels like she got quality time with me every day. So that's the that's those things are the things that have to happen. It's like you got core, you got your core. And core. Then and then I'm like, then I need if I will go insane if I don't work on my own personal projects and my own personal growth because then I'll just be on a on a treadmill. That's so how I feel. That's a curse of being an artist, right? You're not you're not sane like you're saying if you don't pursue these. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Then you feel like you're not um, investing time in yourself to like burn as brightly as you can, you yeah. know and. I remember that saying. Yours. Yeah, that's a good way. To, that's a cool way to and, look at it. And um, so then, but some days you just can't. You don't get to the, you don't get to the your your time, and then it sucks. It feels like I just lost a day. How do you and, keep yourself calm? Because I, I I know the feeling. I I'm sure a lot of artists relate to that. It's just, it's tough. Yeah. So the first thing I did was I realized that. Um, giving my kid really good attention and like. He, like spending time with her that that is an accomplishment like that that's like a so then the first thing I did was I stopped beating myself up over it because I'm like I am accomplished like I'm actually creating like just like a piece of art I'm creating <laughs> a kid like and I, her her psyche and her exp her memories of like being a kid mm -hmm. so uh, that is an, an art that I'm creating so then I I, I, I can enjoy those days you, you know just change your mindset change my mindset so <laughs> i'm like okay project. so yeah so yeah she's a project yeah. and then and then um so then i i get out of that thing where i'm beating myself up over it but then the next thing is i'm like um do even like t 15 or 10 minutes of what yeah. you love just like find a way to just schedule that in and then you don't even have to you just need to sit down and draw a couple shapes and then it, yeah. that's different than a day where you just didn't do anything Dude, but you're you're super hard working and i think we actually skated by the fact i mean there's so much to talk about but we really kind of skipped how long it even took to make the secret ponchos the game because right. i feel like you you just just say it like it's no big deal but yeah how long did it take <laughs> oh we're still making it so we but it, we i mean it's it, out though. yeah it's like, out yeah. yeah so we it took um it took four years for the game to come out exactly and then and then we kept then we brought it to a PC, which was another year. And then we, now we're working on, um, you know, upgrading the game and making it a free to play game. So yeah, it's, it's been, a, it's been about, been working on it like eight years now. Jesus. See, that's funny. Cause they just say, oh yeah, I just made a game. It's like, <laughs> okay, no, you spent four years of your life and it was, uh, the four years were full time working on it, right? Four years. Yeah. We're full time. Wow. And then that's insane. I think. Once again, you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit in this <laughs> case. I think you should brag about it a lot more. Be because just think about how many people have ideas of things they'd want to create. It's like, hey, I want to make a short film and maybe one day a movie and then, or I want to make a book. And it's those challenges are not only incredibly hard, they're going to take yeah years of your life. And then to come, yeah, just the fact that you did it and it's such a cool looking and uh, uh, I guess like even the way you approach the mechanics. And I'm sure that also came from probably fighting as well for that game is it's so cool yeah the um thing i learned from that game and i had a friend when i the same guy uh my friend kevin walsh he was the jazz musician guy roommate yeah. i remember at one point he was like i'm gonna write a novel and so he sat down and he had a story in mind he started writing a novel and every day before and after his work he'd go to the coffee shop and work on his novel and he was working on it for like five years or something and then by the end he hated his novel <laughs> And he was like, I hate this. Like, I, I learned so much about, like, how a writer should have a voice. And he's like, I hate everything. And then he just didn't want to finish it. And then because he grew so much during that five years. And then um, I remember um, when I was working on my game, I kind of felt the same thing. And I learned something about the creative process is that when you start a creative project, it's really exciting and you just get all these endorphins and dopamines from just the the imagining that you're a guy that made a cool thing <laughs> and imagining you just imagine you don't even fully imagine the whole product you just imagine the highlight reel of everything and you're like it's really exciting then you make it and you it's fun when you start making it every single minute has a lot of progress mm -hmm. but then at the about two thirds of the way in, the creative process on a long-term project gets really tough, Slows down. and yeah. you have to like work through like days where you're just like 
put you're making two steps backwards instead of a step forward when you're undoing things that you did already because they're not right or you know and then you just beat yourself up over it and those and and it's like um i think even if say you're climbing like a mountain mm -hmm. right like the first the idea of like hey let's let's go do this this is exciting and you're going to be like a guy that does conquers this thing and then the beginning part you're probably feeling good but that last bit that there's like the last two thirds is a grind and mm -hmm. then i think that's sad that when people quit that because they feel like oh my thing isn't good or whatever the thing i learned is that's just a normal part of the creative process so you should just be like oh now i'm just in that part and you got to finish like just finish stuff you know and did you yell at your friend to finish his book huh i <laughs> well i didn't know i didn't know this at that time that um, that was what was happening yeah. but then i i his experience when i was going through it, i'm like oh i saw then I, I saw the pattern i'm like okay this is that thing you know was your advice to finish it uh, to finish this project because yeah. what you're saying is that what you learned is to finish this and i i can see how yeah if something takes you years and then naturally or hopefully i mean i guess it's not naturally but hopefully if you're learning and getting better because I'm, not only that's the goal it's a natural progression of being a creative of course by yeah you know five years from the moment that you started you're going to be so much better yeah what he, what he wanted to do was he wanted to start a new novel because it was like the grind of working on this one was driving him up the wall and he didn't <laughs> like it didn't feel good he got sick of his own project which is normal right yeah and then but the th um, but the first steps the spark of a new project seemed exciting and triggered all those endorphins again so and then i um that's always the case is you can't just like it's very seductive but you can't that's just normal that the beginning it's part like of the career is always greener on the other side yeah, yeah. but you gotta like you got to finish stuff and there, it's always a grind, you know, but it's once again, it's your, you talking from that, uh, the creative, the creative gene perspective. Is that the name? The Sorry. selfish gene, selfish gene, the creative gene. selfish yeah. gene, just like, uh, I guess, understanding your psychology, right? <laughs> the way you're talking. Yeah. It's like, I, I know there's no more dopamine for this. You've been doing this for too long. Yeah. It's boring. <laughs> yeah. Keep going with it though. Yeah. Because you know, in the beginning you wanted to make a, a write a book and finish it. And mm -hmm. then that's what you're doing. So just, you know, and, um, and, but I, I had to go, there was a period on Secret Ponchos, like year three and four, where at like two in the morning, I'd have to just like put on some motivational music and just go for a run and just like, and or like listen to some in something inspiring That's and just call. feed myself motivation of like boxing or whatever I could f get my hands on just to kind of get tough, get in that tough mm -hmm. mindset where I'm like gonna, uh, it's, I'm not gonna quit, you know? Did you listen to Arnold? I listen to Arnold yeah. a lot. Yeah, he's good. He's good for that. I listen to all of those. <laughs> like yeah. those, oh, like they were my basically running soundtrack, and I had to. Nice. It became a ritual to listen to those things whenever I got. I. It definitely helps. Sometimes it could be too much though, but it helps. You know, what I mean, sometimes they're such grand personalities and the achievements are so huge that almost like it does the opposite of the effect. You're like, well, I can never get there, but. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not how you're supposed to re to react <laughs> to it. Yeah, but uh, so then uh, is the advice to finish? So you're saying finish the project, even though you hate it. Yeah. Because how do you approach it? Because, yeah, it's just it may not even be as good as what you can do now. You know, uh, finish uh, it because it's true that you gained experience and your next one will be better. But you need to um, you need to gain experience finishing things, too. Yeah. And but th yeah, go ahead, sorry. that process of finishing something. That's a tough process, and I I think a lot of people start personal projects, but the very very few people finish them. Yeah, and you just need to build confidence that you can close things that you start. You know, and yeah, this is such a common thing. I think there was something like the idea is ten percent, and then ninety percent is just like hard work to finish it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think that idea, even if you hate it, say you wrote a, your first book and it. And you you were like at a beginner level when you started it, and then five years later you're at a more advanced level, and you look at the book and you're like, oh man, like I wrote so much of this at my beginner level. If I rewrote this now, I'd be at an advanced level. It's okay. Don't just finish it anyways, and that's that's where you were at, and then your next book is going to be where you're at at that time, you know. And I think the challenge of being an artist is that, is that if you do want to present that work, which I mean you do because that's part of creative process. It's hard to show something that you're unhappy with right. or in some sort of way, right? Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, like you're saying, it makes sense. You may not like it now, but not uh, you're probably looking at it from your own perspective of four years where people 
most people will probably like it a lot because you're just like nitpicking it which I like what we mentioned previously about people who are really good but they're just not happy with themselves so they think they're not good enough I guess there, there's got to be an element in that but yeah but it's sort of an illusion like the unfinished project that in your head is like a 9 out of 10 or something but is I don't know like there's not value in it it's only it's only in your own ego right yeah and but i think there's value in being a person that can like finish something you know and i know i struggle with that and I, actually i don't know if you remember but just like doing finished pieces is really hard for me i it, just because it, for the same reason i think that that last grind but also even understanding what that grind should look like because yeah finishing something especially a piece of art it, it is a very different skill set and a different like, like it's so completely different from the beginning or the mid mid stage of a process, you know what I mean? And I mean same with animation, like doing polishing on a, you know, if you go from step to whatever to like you go into linear or whatever, mm -hmm. but like that let that final polish, you have to have some sort of understanding of an eye for it, and that's where I think having a good mentor is really important, because most likely you're not even going to see the things that you need to perfect, which is I think which is why I probably struggle in finishing work. It's like I, I think I need more people to tell me. Just do this or <laughs> copy a bunch of work or sometimes something. Sometimes it's good. That's nice to have deadlines because it just forces you to finish it, right? But I guess then you probably learn a bunch of tricks, which maybe are good, you know, uh, to create a finished work. Because, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe that tricks. I want to go back to, I made a quick note here. I want to go back to one thing you mentioned really briefly. You were saying how when you're looking at your designers in the game, you're noticing that they're just copying things without... Um, understanding what the like what is the true purpose of the project that you're working on and i i, f I don't know if you go on art station a lot uh, mm -hmm. uh, for people who don't know it's just like a you know it's like the it used to be a website called cg society or a bunch of just like a or you know maybe even deviantart it's just a place where people post work and usually a lot of concept art and illustration and maybe it's just typical meaning or just like it's a it's a normal thing where you just you see a lot of derivatives like a lot of work that looks like something else and I know, I know it's really hard to make something that is really true to yourself or really true to like the message that you're creating. But there's definitely, uh, I don't know, have you, have you noticed, if you haven't been to the website, but if, have you noticed this in other artists where it seems like they're trying to cre recreate something that looks like someone else rather than trying to yeah. kind of follow that? Yeah, I see that a lot with concept art. It's that it seems very, um, like digital concept art mm -hmm. seems very incestuous with the like creative content you know yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. there everyone's looking at the same artists and then everyone's trying to mimic the same stuff and then I think it's really important then to uh, um, to find different sources of inspiration you know and I know with I know I see that with you like with the when you look at reference you're trying to look at different things than other people are mm -hmm. and I think if you can abstract things a little bit like one layer of abstraction so if you're gonna you know paint a I don't know. Paint, you say you're going to paint a barbarian, then <laughs> don't go look at other concept art of barbarians as your reference. You look at like, um, you know, may maybe look at s if you're trying to design something new. Maybe look at like different periods of history or something, or different, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, or just think about try and find some aspect that's outside of it. That's a one layer abstracted and then use that as your inspiration and then you can you'll, you'll come up with something new yeah it's almost like you're adding like a, another element to it yeah that's very interesting and i think because most people oh that's that's a thought i had when i was actually driving here is i was thinking that people stress a lot on the visual style especially in 2d art but i know although in animation there's such thing as style and personal style it seems like that the idea of a personal style is, is a lot less stressed and I was trying to figure out why, and maybe it is because y you're actually trying to be like someone else always. Because most people, you know, you do animation to get a job, which means you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta be like an actor. You have to look like someone else, so that personal voice maybe gets a little subdued just out of necessity. And so what we're talking about right now, I guess it's probably the same thing in concept art, right? People are just trying to be like someone else, like, hey, I want to draw so I can look like I can work for Blizzard. Which is probably where this is all coming from, right? Yeah, and it's interesting with personal style. I, I find, um, huh, like, people, there's the content 
of what you want to express at the core. And then the outside superficial layer is, oh, the style of the way you make your lines or the colors you use or that, you know, like, um, but in a way you're, and so people always struggle for like, what is that external style, the, mm -hmm. the superficial style? But I think what they need to focus on more to find that voice is, um, to find that unique voice, I think they f need to focus on the inside of like, what do they want to communicate? Like what, what in their life is beautiful or worth expressing? And then when you express that, doesn't matter how you draw it, it's, it's going to start um, feeling more authentically like your own style, like your own personality is going to come through it. You know, what if you don't know what you like? Well, that's why it's important to like live life and have experiences and, and sort of um, be a little introspective as an artist, right? Because otherwise you're not really, again, if you don't know what you want to express, then you're just making, images. You're just, yeah, you're just yeah. making images, then it's not, you know what I mean? You're not, I, I feel like an artist is exp is expressing and trying to evoke emotion. Yeah, I've done that, just make images. Actually, on, on the previous podcast, I uh, talked uh, with Jose and uh, we're talking about how what you're saying like live life to bring that back into art sometimes i wonder what if you just yeah what if your life is just too normal in some sort of way and then you know of course <laughs> the yeah, struggle allows you to have extreme emotions which probably can be translated into art but i know it doesn't have to be that but yeah i'll tell you a story that ties two of the things we talked together yeah. so i was struggling with okay i'm like i want to get better at art so i'm at drawing <laughs> so you know i'm drawing the same anatomy things over and over the same mm. things that I'm thinking that we should be drawing in our field you mm. know and then like superheroes and that kind of <laughs> stuff and I'm just not feeling like I'm finding my voice with it and I'm trying to struggle with how should I draw that differentiates me from how other people draw you know and, and that style stuff and I'm not really like growing as an artist and then with my kid every night when we go to bed we do this thing where um Cause like in the beginning I was reading her books, mm -hmm. but after a while the kid books, they start driving up the wall a little bit. And so <laughs> I was like, let's, um, let's do something different. Tell me something that you remember that we did today. Mm -hmm. And so she'll, she'll be like, Oh, you know, we were, we bought the banana and then we forgot the banana at the <laughs> store. And then, you know, and then like, she just has this like weird thing. So then I, I illustrate it. I write in quotes exactly how she worded it. And then I draw, uh, an image of that thing of her memory. And then every, so we're filling this sketchbook of, of th and sometimes they're really embarrassed. Like they're not my, like some, when <laughs> I had to do my taxes and she's like, yeah, Poppy did too much work and I watched too much TV. And that was like, so, so then I, that was my illustration, me and the Cintiq doing taxes or something. And that then a painful illustration to make. Yeah. yeah <laughs> she's just bored watching t TV, you know, but then, um, when I, um, I love the content of like these, these, uh, things and as an artist now I look from beginning to end of that book and I like improved so much and I'm starting to find my own way that I like drawing Jia and the way I like drawing myself and then all of a sudden those style things just started happening organically yeah, like yeah. I made my own style of drawing but it's because I was focused on genuinely expressing the content instead of worrying about the superficial stuff and then not only that as I grew like I, I got way better at drawing during this this project than all those other things that I didn't care about, you know? Um, and the, so that's really interesting. I, that I really think that to find your own style, you need to just don't think about like, don't think of it like, Oh, how do I draw differently? Think of like, what do what I want to draw? What's important to me? And then you just draw that and then your style will happen. Yeah. That sounds cool. That sounds really, yeah, I guess by the fact that it is so meaningful to you and then, yeah. But have you seen, I guess maybe that's why, there's especially kind of looking in the past and like through our art history I, how many it just like depictions of like here's the, the landscape or like yeah what i'm trying to say is that maybe that subject matter doesn't even have to be so exciting because sometimes trying to come up with a cool idea uh, it, it seems like you should try to reach for something super unique and super cool but maybe it's just like you're saying it's just a even if it's the same subject matter it's just the ex the way you'll execute by the fact that you care so much about it is what's going to give it that voice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think like, I think when you, I didn't understand when people used to draw like 
bowl of fruit or, or do a <laughs> Actually, that's yeah, a good point. Yeah, I didn't under w when I was younger, I didn't understand it because I would look at it and be like, I've seen a billion paintings of a bowl of fruit. But now I totally get it that like, um, as an artist, if you're just looking at something, I think I give you this example, like say there's like um, a cigarette butt on the ground, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, if you stop and you look at that cigarette butt, you're like, I'm gonna draw this thing, right? Then all of a sudden your whole world stops and you're focused on this cigarette butt. And then you're like, you notice there might be a little bit of red lipstick on it. And you're like, oh, that's cool. And then the way the sun is hitting it and the way that it looks like it might've been there in the street for like two days, you know, or something. And it's kind of like a little bit, and then you start trying to capture that. And your job is, you're, so now this thing, the whole world disappears and goes, out of focus mm -hmm. except for this one thing that and then you're actually capturing it it's like all oh, it becomes like an intimate experience with you and that that cigarette butt right and mm -hmm. and only and as an artist you spend like three or four or hours or a day or whatever just like appreciating every little thing about it and it's a really intimate experience and i think what you're doing is you're trying to capture it and show someone else and hope that they feel one little bit of that connection that you felt mm. with it, you know, yeah. and that they, someone might go, Oh, that lipstick is kind of cool. And maybe <laughs> you like, maybe you just exaggerate a little bit and then it made someone else notice it. And I think that that's what, like, you know, that's yeah, yeah. to me what it, so it's, it is the, it's knowing it's feeling what you want to express. So if you just paint a bunch of barbarians, but you don't feel anything about them, you know? Or it's like, what is it about this barbarian that you want to really communicate and make someone feel? I think that's what's important. He's like, no wonder you're an art director. <laughs> that thinking is so cool. Yeah, and, it, and it's very inspiring because we had that conversation, I think, about trying to come up with a theme for the show and that you just like oversimplified it so much you made it <laughs> sound so easy in that same manner. It's like, oh, you take this one idea and then you just kind of grow it from there. <laughs> yeah, and then the appreciation throughout comes. Actually, what you just mentioned, I follow this guy, um, on Instagram, I think Nicholas Ureeb. I can show you later. Really good artist, but uh, it's interesting that his he made the same comment or kind of the same sentiment just recently. I think he painted like a uh, just a roll of folded paper, and then you know, we, like it's like yeah. you're saying, if you think about it, a roll of folded paper. What's so exciting about that? But yeah, he wrote how yeah you, you may discover so much about it, especially once again if you're really conscious about what it is you're doing, which I usually find difficult to not turn off you know what i mean sometimes you can just paint and not or create something and not really think it through yeah but i guess if you apply it to games it's, uh, the de the deadlines and the time frame is so different that there's a lot more time maybe to think about it while like with a piece of art like even what you're describing right now like with a cigarette but you have to be in a moment really present because if it takes you just let's say just five hours to paint it you, you better make sure that like that uh, thread is like it's really there throughout and I think what you're talking about also before with the having that one clear idea for the game, I actually got a similar, uh, I just like how everything is tying together to me because then I guess when you hear these similar things, it uh, just shows you that, that that is the right path to take because what you're talking about, I don't remember who gave this advice to me, but they're saying how uh, write down a sentence about the painting you want to make and then stick with it, like don't go out of it. So if the sentence is like, uh, let's say a cigarette butt dropped by, a woman in a rush to work let's say that's mm -hmm. just the example just that sentence already gives you so much information and intent and then from there it's it's your job to really make sure that whoever sees that painting they hopefully get that clear idea right. because like you're saying you know if it's in a rush to work how can you show that in a cigarette butt which here is your challenge i guess <laughs> yeah but it, that's so i yeah i love the fact that these uh, similar ideas and maybe even from different fields like you're saying whether it's games or a painting they're kind of coming in together and tying in how do you have such clear vision? I, that's I'm always so fascinated by that because you're you're able to not have like any, yeah. Just you seem like you have a very clear path, and I guess I ask the, ask that because I'm always, yeah. I don't maybe not destructive, but I feel like it's so hard to maybe I don't know, just think of being an artist like really to be sure about what it is you're pursuing because you seem very confident with the projects that you're creating, and then uh, how do you think that happens? Like, yeah, I feel. I feel that um, I'm pretty like something that I notice about myself is I'm very uh, I'm em empathetic to like other people like I can f you know someone's sad I can kind of pick up on it if someone's 
angry. I can kind of, you know, you pick up on it. So I, I have, um, and then, so I, I think that I just try and, um, and I'm very, I am kind of emotional too, you know? So, um, and then I, and then the last thing is I get inspired strongly. Like I feel when I, sometimes when I hear something like a piece of music or something, I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. I just need to like listen to it over and over and over and over. So I try and um, use those use those three things. It's like I try and, pr- for the empathy and emotions, I try and, um, I try and predict how I would want, how my audience might feel, you know? Like I, and I try and have like an emotional goal. Like I see like an emotional core at stuff, you but know? But that's what's allowing you to have that clarity? Yeah, 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 I think like so. Vision, yeah. And then the inspiration, um, the inspiration comes th- where the inspiration, I feel it is, I can relate to how I want them to feel because like if I see a scene in a movie and it really just shakes me up or makes me sad, then it, like that becomes like, that becomes the bar of like, I want to be able to make someone else feel that, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, so I think just take note when you're like, Try and just feel inspired by moments and, and other mm-hmm. work, and that's like one step. And then, yeah, and then I think then you break down what, try and think like, what is the core of what you're feeling? Like, why am I feeling this? What is the core of it? And then you can, then when you approach, um, when you approach baking anything, just make sure you have a thesis, like a single, yeah, simple yeah, yeah. thing you want to accomplish with it. I'm so glad that we're recording this because then I actually go back and <laughs> <laughs> listen to this because that's, yeah, I, I struggle with that a lot, which is why I think it's so cool to be actually doing the show and get people who can just teach me and give me free tips and tricks. <laughs> I'll be learning from it. Um, I guess, you're, so you mentioned uh, you're slowly continuing working on Secret Ponchos, and uh, but you do have a full-time job right now, though. Yeah. But what do you see... Uh, uh, coming up especially creatively in your life because like i mentioned before you're super hard working so i doubt you're just gonna stop there yeah so the that little book i'm making with my daughter yeah so we finished one full sketchbook of when she was four years old nice. and i'm gonna um i think i'm gonna give her that when she's like older like getting married or graduating <laughs> That's or something. A cool idea. And because i don't remember anything from when i was four and now Same. she can remember she has like a this diary this picture diary of all these things that we did together and her little her own voice of what she remembers about it and so i'm gonna try and make one of those every year i'm gonna well until she doesn't like me when she's a teenager <laughs> or something even so, then yeah. even then you gotta make it yeah um but those pictures will be like poppy won't let me have a boyfriend i hate her <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you gonna so, make paint it all dark and angsty but um the um yeah so i want to make the next year next year i really those are all sketches for her being five-year-old, I'm gonna try and make a watercolor, but I don't know Ooh. how to watercolor. But it, it's it. I'm really excited about. It'll force me to learn, and I'm sure the beginning pages are gonna suck, but I'm sure by the end they're gonna be good, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, so that's one project I really want to do. We can paint together. That sounds really cool. I like the how you're finding that motivation. Yeah, like you were saying before, outside of art, which is cool. Because yeah, that sounds like a really unique idea. Yeah, and that goes back to like find what inspires you and channel that channel that into uh whatever you do do you, you think know. you'll publish those books or are they no private? i I'm right now they're private because um it's nice that it's nice that it's just between me and her and it, it removes my own ego from it like mm. i don't yeah, yeah, yeah. because once i start thinking oh people are gonna see it on the internet then it, i might hold back from i might be too scared to make mistakes and then i might be too scared to make bad drawings and yeah, yeah, yeah. so right now it's serving a purpose that i just it's probably you know yeah i can totally relate to that having that pressure of knowing that there is yeah it's like you're saying people are going to see it then yeah i can't let that get into you yeah what yeah a, what about video games are you going to be creating something as well yeah i want to like i always want to be continuing making my own um personal projects so yeah i'm hoping we can like always yeah that's as important like i loved i loved what we did with secret ponchos i never thought that when we started that game it would end up like launching on a playstation and that like people that were like my artistic idols would be tweeting about it and like it had a lot of successes and it didn't have financial success <laughs> at all but it had <laughs> but it had like artistic successes that i was so proud of so what, I what kind of do you have any uh, specific examples about oh that? man yeah like i saw a tweet 
Joe Ma- Joe Matarera yeah. tweeted yeah. Ab- about our game, and I was like, oh my god! And then I messaged him back. I'm like, oh my god! You're, like I re- had all your comic books when I was little, and and then we had gotten a little conversation, and that seems to be the ultimate. Or as I try to think about uh, when I create artists, that you're, I don't think as an artist it's possible to become world famous, or it's inc- incredibly hard just because of how art is and the the saturation of it, but. To me, that seems to be a pretty good goal to, or as a goal that thought to work towards is like being able to get respect from your peers or people you look up to. That's got to be like the ultimate. Yeah. Yeah, it felt good. And um, my friend Tony went to his doctor, and um, his doctor Tony had like a like a rash on his arm, <laughs> and it was from he thought from his stress. And so okay. the doctor was like, "Oh, look, why are you stressed?" He's like, "Oh, I'm working a lot of." He's like, oh, what do you do? I make video games. Well, what video game do you make? And then he said, Secret Punches. And then the doctor switched from, like, doctor mode to, <laughs> oh, that, that, that game is the shit. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And then he, like, started. And then Tony felt so good that, like, his, he made something that people, like. You guys are famous. Not but famous, but yeah, it's, like nice that, so it's nice that, that it's nice when people actually, like, know, like, saw your work. Like Especially I, when it's out of your friend circle. Yeah. Right? Because then, not that it doesn't mean that your friends like it, but when people who are not even related to you in any way find out about that yeah so i have two i have two goals uh as a in in making video games Mm. is i want to make there's like your sphere of there's a circle of who sees it right you Mm. said your friend circle so if you make a personal project your friends on might see it on facebook or your family and they'll be proud of you and stuff right or, but then that circle can grow and grow and eventually it can grow to maybe like a worldwide audience mm-hmm. it, it like see, knows, has listened to your song or has read your poem or, or played your game, mm-hmm. right? That's exciting. But that's, that's not the only goal because if that's the case, then I would just go work on like a FIFA game yeah. modeling soccer balls and be like, yeah, everyone. <laughs> but the Some thing people must be making so soccer the balls. The <laughs> second factor of that is what, going back to that, um, that thing of if I died and someone else worked on it is like, what was my level of influence, creative influence on that? So I want to balance those two circles. So it's like the, I want to have a, a product where I, I really shaped what it, what it is and combined with, I want that thing to have uh, maximum, like see the most people. So you do think about that, that uh, marketability is not the right word, but it, it's somewhere around there, right? The fact that more, like the majority of people would like it. Yeah, you just, you just want people to um, enjoy what you create, to experience what you create, because you're trying to create emo- you're trying to create an emotional experience, but to do that, you need an, an audience. Mm-hmm. So if you make an amazing poem and then no one can read it, then no one can, you, you've evoked no emotions on y- anyone but yourself, right? So the, the audience is just you, and then. But that feels like a dangerous path, path to follow, like you're saying, because if you're completely catering to the audience, then you end up like with the, I don't know, you see a lot of games or art online, especially like the art station that mentioned, like the pictures that are popular, are like are either like half naked girls or, oh, yeah. you know, that yeah. Know, yeah. So you don't want to, you're not catering to the audience. Like you're not trying to say like, you're going to, I'm going to shape my thing around so that you'll like it. Mm-hmm. But what you're doing is you're making something and you're just hoping people, s- you want people to see it and they may or may not like it, but you, you want to, you just want people to, uh, I mean, I just want people to like, uh, play have played my game, you mm-hmm. know, or yeah. something, or know know about it. That so that I'm not, I don't feel like I'm making games just in a vacuum for only me and my my little brother or something, <laughs> you know. But um, but yeah, I definitely don't want to. Like the goal isn't. It's different than like making a main like a blockbuster kind of thing that appeals to the masses. It's not really about that. It's just about having. I want to try and have his. I want to have an audience, and I want to have influence on. Uh, like a creative expression Mm -hmm. like i want my creative expression to be felt by people i think that's my goal as an artist like i want to say something and i want someone to um i want to communicate something i want someone to receive the communication Mm. you know it sounds very honest which you do see those cases where people only intend their creation to be they make it out of love and maybe not even intended to be big but then those things do I don't know if often, but become big because it's like your approach is so honest towards it, right? Yeah. It's like pure uh, because of the emotion you're trying to create. Yeah, it's like it's like you. Um, I want to be be careful about using words like big and stuff because it's not like about a product. Um, 
it's not like in terms of like having financial success or anything but it's just that you want uh you you want to communicate something and you want someone you want to know that that communication was like received mm-hmm. by someone you know that the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then then you can see like oh did it evoke any emotions or did it did it work or not you know so are you ready for another four years <laughs> huh. creating a game that's intense yeah i can't okay so that game four years i worked on it without paying myself right so see, that's that's even more intense yeah yeah so that w- that kind of was hard because i went into to do that i'm like okay the law lo- the less money i can spend um in like the more i can lower my quality of life the longer i can work on this project and so you kind of go into like starving artist mode where you're like okay i'm gonna like i really love this thing but then when you have a family you, they're making sacrifices mm. and then it, it becomes like a blurry line so i think like it's you can i don't think i can do that again now that i have a kid mm. and stuff i don't like it would i i can do that to myself but i can't do that to her so yeah. so now i have to find different like i can't just stop working and live off a tiny bit of savings for four years you have to or or, or working like one or two days a week or something like now you know, I have to provide a reasonable, um, consistent quality of life for her. So I got to find, so I can't, uh, like, um, I don't have as much time available. Mm. So I got to try and make things work with less time. That seems incredibly tough. And uh, that's why uh, I'm very curious to hear more from other artists and how they manage that specifically, because, you know, time management in general and priorities is such a, it seems to be a very common topic because just, you know, everyone faces 24 hours and yeah. figuring that out is super challenging and being very efficient but then like you're saying fair to everyone else around you yeah because it i think that project did ultimately kind of cost me my marriage and stuff right so it it was yeah it um i don't want to do that like to my (laughs) child you know Uh, but then but i think that i chose something that was like a big scale project like Mm -hmm. making a large scale video game um that required four years but now I'm using like smaller, like the little sketchbook project with Jaya. That that's not gonna ruin any lives or anything. So, <laughs> and then you know, so I think, and then I think um, finding the right level to take on. I think does it does do those books give you the same uh, relief of creativity? Yeah, no, it does. It, so it's not the scale of the project; it's the scale of the creativity. You mm-hmm. know that. <sighs> cool. We got a. Um, yeah, I'm excited for you. You gotta, you gotta let me know about the game, though. I'm curious what you're. Okay. Doing. Would you? Uh, again, before we get into recurring questions, I try to have a couple that are consistent to the show. Do you? Uh, I was actually wondering about that. Do you plan to go into try something in VR? Is that some, is that something that's interesting to you, especially in games? Yeah, I like I. I de- I um, when I first started thinking about VR, I got really excited about a particular like aspect of it, mm-hmm. and and then I wanted. As soon as you start imagining a game, like it's just you get excited, and mm-hmm. and I think like um, yeah, there, like I don't really care if something's like what format it's in, like if if a game is VR or if it's like a computer game or if it's like a board game. It's more like the content of it, mm-hmm. and so. But I got excited by a piece of content that would be a cool VR game at one point, and then I was like, okay, if I ever make a VR game, I want to make something like this, you know, and yeah, yeah. and. Yeah. So is that a yes or a no? <laughs> well, no. I, I I don't think like my next game is going to be a VR game. Is no. it too complicated? Um, no, it's not that it's too complicated. It's because it, a VR game can be really simple, mm. right? But it's just um, yeah. I just I have a list of things that I'm super excited about doing, and and you can only do the thing that's on the top of the list, and that that one is a few down, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get it. But if someone came up to me and they're like, "Hey, we need a VR game, and here's a budget," then <laughs> I, I would shuffle that it. to the top. Yeah, so <laughs> you just need that. Uh, it's like whatever pace for the time, like you're saying. Yeah. To be a provide, and then just show your creativity. Yeah. And then, actually, as an art director, do you feel like at work you can get that fulfillment these days? Because, or mm. does it still not, is it still not the same as like you're saying, creating your own game? Yeah, they're like it's like different different types of fulfillment. So I think on my game. Um, that I work on my full-time job, I feel fulfillment um, with solving those challenges that are there in front of me. Mm-hmm. But then the reason that I go home and make independent projects is because I have a, 
other challenges that excite me that I can't get from, you mm -hmm. know, working on a big commercial title, you know? So I find value in both. Like mm -hmm. I think, but they're two different, they fill different needs. Uh, I think for my personal projects, it's just more about expressing something personal, you mm -hmm. know, and okay. creating a product around that. And then the other one is more like, almost like, um, like how do we work with this team and make things as good as we can and, and like, you know, you look at what the designers are trying to express and like, okay, how can I help you guys express that? And it's like a different thing. So they're just like different constraints? Yeah. I learn a lot at work and I learn a lot in my other personal projects. So they, like as long as I'm learning, I get to keep excited about both. Out of cu curiosity, uh, uh, it seems like a challenge. If you work with a team and you know, uh, like the team could be junior, for example, so like the what they can't create you know, it's not on the like high level as you would like to, because I'm sure, you know, different companies, different budgets. How do you like, have you found creative ways of either working with the people and because if you have a vision and then the vision that you have cannot be achieved simply because of, you know, time or actually sometimes skill, like, have you found ways going around that? Yeah, I think like, you know that game um, Octodad? Did you ever see that game? Maybe. It's like a really, it was like a PlayStation game and it was just about this octopus that he's an octopus but he has a human family and he's trying <laughs> to pretend he's a human and he wears <laughs> human clothes and then he um every he has to do things like make his kid a bowl of cereal in the morning <laughs> and it, the, <laughs> g the gameplay is you're just trying to control these tentacles and like everyone's kind of if you screw up people start like looking at you funny and stuff and start <laughs> realizing your family starts realizing you're an octopus and um That's a great idea. so the team that made this it was a they were like a there were students in uh, school and they made this as their student project and then they like after school they're just like let's let's make it again as a commercial project and so they didn't have a ton of experience like 3d modeling and all that stuff but the style of the game and what they wanted to communicate was aligned with their the with their skill level so it didn't strain it you know like they, they had a very mm -hmm. simple art style that they could all achieve and in the end nobody really knew that it was not a, like a group of veterans that made this game because it it did a good job of achieving what it set out to so i think you need to like look at your team and then sort of the pro project needs to be aligned with that so if you have like like a bunch of like totally newish uh junior people and that's your team you can still make a kick-ass project you just need to you not try and make gta yeah, yeah, 7 yeah. you know or so you, you just adjust your vision then you're just the yeah you pick you pick something that that is aligned you you might focus on something that f the art style is based around simplicity, or you know maybe you make like a really cool like stickman game that's super compelling, mm -hmm. and and that they're like you know and and then if you if your artist can't draw, but then all of a sudden it's like people just love how cool these stickmen are or something you yeah, know people do love stickmen actually I, I know it's an example but you remember those videos of like stickmen fighting or something like yeah that was a huge video yeah yeah uh, so I think I nice. think I think just make sure you're I think the style of the project and the project itself, if it's aligned with the people that are making it so yeah. that they can, you're setting them up for success. That's the thing. Very cool. I'm learning. I'm learning too much. I definitely am going to have to <laughs> really <laughs> listen to this. I really like the, what you mentioned about how, what, what would, how would the project be like if you're dead? I know it's very, <laughs> very dark, <laughs> but I think it's such a cool way to look at it. All right. So uh, I guess uh, let's do a couple of these recurring questions. Uh, if you were not, if you couldn't or if you weren't creating art can you see yourself doing something else yeah, yeah yeah then i would have i would have done fighting fighting yeah or a little cheating i guess it's an art still but yeah i get it yeah i guess everything yeah, or, okay. or music um yeah i would have loved yeah I, the thing is i can't do is i don't think i would want to just be like working in a oil company you're way too creative for that yeah i need to <laughs> yeah um something about f something about fighting i really liked i don't know it, it was and i'm not like i'm i'm a very gentle person at you are yeah that's why it's surprising how much a how much you can kick ass but <laughs> well i don't know if i i don't think i can kick ass anymore but kick ass. but it was there's See, just you're being too nice once again <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i think those those were the things that I felt the most torn between. I was, I'm not that good at mu music as I'd like to be, but I, I really, I love it so much. Do you miss competing? 
Oh, competing? Yeah, yeah I really, I, I miss competing a lot. Um, but now, it's interesting because now I'm too old to like, really, like even now if I wanted to go back and start doing and competing, I would feel like oh, I, I kind of, mi- you know, I, sh- I miss that window, and then. Mm. Well, because you, you would want to do it like full on. You, are you the kind of person who, if you do something, you want to do it to the fullest? I was, and now I think that now that that window's gone, I kind of think like I kind of want to start going back and doing it recreationally mm-hmm. now. But before I, d- I it was like all or nothing for some reason. Just gotta watch out for your hands and knees. Yeah, <laughs> these things make money. <laughs> <laughs> Can't. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess the second question you kind of answered. Uh, it's if there's no right way to make art, you know, being art being such a broad term, but also there's so many rules or no rules at all. Um, how do you usually judge yourself um, to make sure that you're creating something? Or do you have rules for yourself to make sure when cre- you're creating art that you're, uh, I don't know, m- making grade with some sort of guidelines? Do you have that? I think you may have answered that, though. So, like, the question is if you... Um, if there's no rules to create art just because it's such a, like a, it's such a broad world. Yeah. Is that not a good question? Maybe it's not a good question. <laughs> no, but because to me, what you're saying before, is like kind of being honest with yourself and then knowing uh, w- whatever the, the path you're going to follow with that intent and the feeling that seems to be your criteria uh, of uh, creating something. Because, you know, it's like you're saying before, you can draw or create anything, right? And then it can be an abstract painting. And then what rules are you following then? But I guess in the end, what I learned from you yeah. <laughs> is th- that you just find that intent, right? And find that feeling and just continue pursuing that and whatever that means and whatever those that create uh, rules that can create, right? Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Did I, th- I learn? Yeah. I think <laughs> for me, just like, I know I have like a goal of what I want to cr- create, what the thesis of something is. And then that sort of just guides, I guess, as long as I deliver on that, then I feel good about it. Yeah. And we got the last one. What advice would you give uh, your younger self, let's say around the time that you're going to post-secondary to get your paper? Is there anything you'd tell yourself then, if you could? Yeah, for sure that, like, now I realize when I, you have less time, like now that I have a kid and I'm single parenting, I have a jo- day job and I still have to try and find time for personal projects and stuff, I've become so much better at making minutes count, Mm. you know? And I think if somehow you could just be like, hey dude, like (laughs) you're, you know, there's a, you could be way more efficient with your time. That would be like, you can, but it's kind of like if you pretend you have a a job where you earn um, a lot of money, Mm -hmm. but you are really bad with money, managing your money. So you always waste it all, right? And then all of a sudden, you lose that job, you have no money, and then you learn how to like budget yourself properly. But then you're like, oh man, now if I went back and was <laughs> earning that much money, I think how much I would save, right? Are you saying there's no other way to learn it but to fail? I, I think, yeah, I think you need to, you need to kind of feel that it's scarce and precious, and then you'll learn how to manage it better. And then, so I, I feel like I would want to go back and tell, tell myself to- Do you think you would listen? No, no. <laughs> because <laughs> See, that's because when you hear that stuff, even at that age, you all hear that time, stuff right? all the time. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. in one ear, out the other. Uh, there's no other way to learn. Well, I'll try to. I'll try to learn. If you're listening, <laughs> take that advice. But it's very hard to take. And, um, and the lighting in the studio is so nice right now. I think this would be a cool painting. I think okay, it's like the first day of spring in Vancouver. I'm, I'm actually gonna take a quick photo. I think it's gonna be cool. Maybe I'll make you into a painting. We're. Uh, I guess if you're listening, we're in uh, on Hastings Street in Vancouver and we're look, looking out onto the just yeah on the street it's really cool sometimes people distract us but the lighting is so amazing because yeah it's already like getting close to sunset okay one second I gotta take this photo <laughs> I know that's terrible podcasting we're not gonna leave any more <laughs> silence, <laughs> silence. Uh, dude you know, I, 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 th- yeah, go ahead. I thought of one thing though one contradiction to what I was saying it's like okay. it's funny in my video game work yeah. I want to I m- said I want to make stuff where um, I have the most, the m- where I get to make a s- creative statement with it, and then I want, then I really want it to have like a l- wide group of people that can hear it, right? Mm-hmm. Hear that statement. But it's funny because I find fulfillment with my JF project. That's the opposite. I want to have, it's a maximum amount of um, creative statement I'm making with that, but I don't care if anybody sees it or not. So 
Yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. But does it feel complete to you by the fact that she sees it? Is yeah, that the, right? Yeah. The, does it mean that does it the, does it always have to be someone on uh, the other end appreciating the art for it to be complete? Do you feel like that? I think because you, when you're creating it, you could be that person on the other end too, mm. right? So you it always starts with one as your audience is you and then so that might be you might you might be okay it might fulfill it but i i hear that example brought up often like if you could just go into a cabin in the woods make a bunch of art and then just destroy it or people will never see it is that satisfying it, you know that's f- yeah it's funny because i um i thought when i was a kid i wanted to learn guitar and i remember thinking it's probably for the wrong reasons like i wanted probably to be cool or <laughs> you know like i wanted that I wanted people to think of me as a person that could play guitar. But then, um, and I learned it. And then as an adult, I wanted to learn the cello. And I remember when I was thinking about what, would I ever, if I was in a deserted island, would I um, would I want to learn the guitar still, right? And? And I think the answer was no. Back then, the answer was no. I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. But then as, as an adult, when I wanted to learn the cello, it's just because I found the cello so beautiful. Mm-hmm, and yeah. And I sucked at cello. <laughs> like I, I, I started learning it as an adult. And one thing with classical instruments is adults, people will start learning them when they're kids because they're forced to, and they either stay with it until they're an adult or they drop out. But it's really rare that an adult starts a classical mm. instrument. And then I found out that there wasn't really infrastructure. So I was doing like, I started in grade one Suzuki cello and I was doing um, recitals with five-year-olds playing Twinkle Twinkle, Li- we all playing <laughs> Twinkle Twinkle Little Star <laughs> together. And it was like, um, How's that for motivation? But then, <laughs> you know, um, but I enjoyed it. And I remember thinking with the cello, I would do this if it was just me on mm. a deserted island because there was something I felt like I was doing it for the right reasons, you know? Like I felt like I was doing it because I really appreciated yeah. it. Um, and I knew I would never, no one, I don't even want anyone to hear me play cello because <laughs> it sounds awful, right? But um, yeah, so. Uh, but I, g- I guess sometimes it's okay to do something for the wrong reasons as long as you transition to the good ones eventually, you know, because I, like you're saying, I do wish my parents, for example, put me into music classes when I was younger. And I'm sure like kind of wrong reasons, but at least the person that I am now, I appreciate those skills a lot more. Oh yeah. Like everything, like I, now I really love the guitar again. Mm-hmm. At now I, now I would play it on a desert island for sure. And then, <laughs> and I learned kickboxing for the wrong reasons. I, I saw a Van Damme movie and I'm like, that's what that's I want to do. Reason. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> It's a great reason. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And you, ki- and you can k- kick people in the face. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I think we're going to have to rip up pretty soon. I really appreciate you coming on. I think it was very enlightening and s- dropping so much knowledge. And, yeah, you're a super cool person and a good friend. So I'm uh, very happy to have you on. And just, uh, as always, yeah. yeah ho- always. Hopefully I can become a better person. But just... Uh, <laughs> having these conversations and uh, oh, those are nice yeah. things that I enjoyed being on here it was super fun sweet yeah we're gonna have to get you back and then along with the sliding it's so cool um, is there um, is there do you want people to find you somehow or the projects do you have a website you wanna drop there uh, for people to look up uh, no that's okay <laughs> there's, there's yeah. no you know <laughs> <laughs> you, if um, yeah my um, no I don't really like I don't really Twitter or do like, I mean, yeah, I think like my project is called secret ponchos, but in a way I right now don't want anyone to go check it out. I want, <laughs> really? I want, yeah, I want, um, I want people to wait until the, the new version that we're doing is ready. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to, then we're, cause right now, um, yeah, it's, it's like, there's a version out there that I'm, we're making a new version. I'm super proud of it. And I yeah. think like, I don't even want to, yeah, I want people to wait until <laughs> until the good one is out. Wait until the super awesome version. <laughs> but, but I think, um, yeah, maybe next t- next time I come around, we'll be able to be further along where we can like, share stuff. Talk about a sp- very special project then, I guess. Then, yeah. yeah. Cool. I guess we'll just have to get you back. Um, well, all right. Well, uh, I guess then, uh, everyone, thanks for listening. I guess uh, if you want to learn more about Creative Theory Podcast, just look us up on Instagram or Facebook. Um, We'll be back in two weeks. Otherwise, next week we got Snack Cast where one with our awesome, wonderful friends. So if you're going to be missing your uh, dose of uh, art conversations, uh, make sure you tune in. Otherwise, yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. It was super cool. And uh, I'm going to have to re-listen to this. All right, people. Thank you very much. Bye.